I want to talk to you today about why you should deconstruct your Christianity. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Um, the Bible itself tells you that you are supposed to examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. There is nothing wrong with saying, am I right in what I'm doing? Am I right in this religion that I'm part of or whatever else? That's actually just scientific, logical, rational thinking. Even science out there, they need to logically look at things and say, is this equation that we've come up with, is this correct? You always examine yourself. Make sure that your own beliefs and teachings are in line with reality. Okay? Now I'm going to come right out and I'm going to tell you the truth about modern Christianity. Uh, a lot of these ministries out there, what they'll try to do is they'll try to say, well, you've left Christianity, but let me draw you back into it. No, that's not what is right. What is right is, why did you leave your version of Christianity? And is it in line with the scriptures? You see, here we go. Blunt, brutal honesty coming up. What is called Christianity today by the vast majority of the people out there has no basis at all in Scripture. None. Actually, what it is, it's the church of the Antichrist that is coming in the future. That's the only basis it has in Scripture. It is prophesied in the book of Revelation. I'll get into that here in a little bit to show you the proof. But let me just say this. I'm going to give you five proofs that what's going on out there with these church buildings has no basis in the scriptures. Okay, number one, um, church buildings, what are they for? They are to turn you into a good tax-paying citizen. That's what they are. Uh, you'll go to these church buildings, which are actually under IRS code section 501c3. Uh, they're tax-exempt organizations uh, given permission to exist by the government. Show me that in the scriptures. It's not in there. But they will have you come in and they will tell you how to have a, a good family and a good job and make sure you give your 10% tithe and the whole thing. That's what they're there for. There's not one verse of scripture in the entire New Testament that tells you anything of the kind. Again, you're dealing with a satanic system that damns the vast majority of people to hell, coming there thinking that they're doing good and that they're pleasing God, and they're doing things that don't even appear in the Bible. Very interesting. Number two, the church buildings of today modern churchianity are there to shield their people from the reality of this world. That's why you will never hear sermons talking about uh, war crimes or conspiracy theory type of things. Let's look at this. Is it accurate? Is it not? Is it, you know, weigh out the stuff. You'll never hear those types of things. Controversial subjects are avoided in the church buildings because it's all about just bringing more people in and getting more money. Let's just be honest here. Number three, they will make you a passive uh, hearer and not a soldier for Jesus Christ. I mean, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war, like the old hymn says. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Another old hymn. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. All these old hymns that are no longer sung anymore in these modern church buildings because they're too offensive. They want you to be a passive hearer. And I'll get into this a little bit more as we continue here. Number four, they will never explain the difficult passages of Scripture. You see, because they can't tell you the reality of this world, how bad things really are and how bad things have always been. And so they'll leave you with this weird thing of that the Bible's this positive, wonderful message. It's God's love letter to man. Oh, uh, well, that's only part of the truth of the Bible. You see, there's some very horrible, terrible things written about in this book because this book is here to convict you that you're a sinner and that I'm a sinner and that Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners. That's what it's about. So you aren't going to be taught the truth and they just want you to be a passive hearer. Don't ask too many questions. All right? Get back into that in just a minute here. And number five, the church buildings, their agenda... And it is their agenda because they are satanic. They eventually turn you into an atheist, which is why these people are doing this whole deconstruct Christianity thing. That's the whole point. You are actually a success when you become an atheist. That's what they want from you. 
Church buildings are there to keep you away from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you see, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then you no longer need the church building. You no longer need the hireling up there paying his six-figure salary or something and um, so he can live in his nice parsonage next door to the church building or something. See, they eventually want to turn you into an atheist. It's kind of like if you would say, well, uh, I want to learn how to farm so I can grow my own food. You know who will fight you? If you would get right down to it and whatever, it would be uh, Big Ag and the whole grocery store thing and all that. They don't want you to grow your own food because then you don't need them. Well, same kind of a thing with the church building issue. And I realize, you know, farmers aren't coming after people that have a garden on their property. I get that. And grocery stores won't come and threaten you. But please understand the point that I'm trying to make there. But here's how this whole thing works. You get this young person and they're raised going to church every time the doors are open. You know, they're dedicated as a baby and whatever else. And my parents go here and my aunts and uncles, and my grandparents and all my friends, you know, go to the church. And as they get older, they first, everything's just wonderful, great, you know, uh, just think the world of the pastor and, and whatever else. And, and all of a sudden there's some high up guy in the church and um, one week he's not there. You don't really think a whole lot about it, but his wife and children are there and you think, oh, maybe he's at home, he's sick or something. And the next week the wife and children are there again, but the man's not there. And uh, hmm, then you're in town sometime and you see this great man of the church and he's got some other woman huh you know and you say oh well that's not good is it oh we don't want to talk about that and fill in the blank with any other situation that goes on there you know you'll see all kinds of sex problems within these church buildings all kinds of fornication and adultery and all this other stuff i mean i literally was going to a methodist church the one time and up in the front row there was a couple that actually swapped wives you know, and I mean, I don't mean just that they're sitting with each other. I mean, more than sitting with each other. Okay. Uh, living together and, you know, committing adultery there. And it was just sort of, well, you know, they're, they're bigger people in the church. You know, so let's just not say anything. So you start to see the hypocrisy. And then a lot of these young people, they go off to college. They'll either go to a public school or they'll go off to college and they start to hear some objections about the Bible. And they'll say, hmm. And see, again, they're being shielded from the truth, the reality of this world, how bad things really are. Um, oh, things are getting better because, see, the, in the secular universities and things, they, their primary philosophical bent is towards evolution, which says that things get better and better with time and not worse and worse, like the Bible teaches. So then they start to have doubts implanted into their mind, and they think, huh, I don't know what to think about this. Yeah, the Bible does say that. And, why would a loving God send people in and, you know, send his children in there and say, kill everybody in the town? And, oh, no. And then they go to their little hireling, which is there actually just as a way to, it's his job, it's his career. So he's not going to say anything to uh, upset the tithers, you know. He wants to keep that money coming in and he's got uh, different positions there at his alma mater that maybe I could get an honorary doctorate or maybe I could have a, you know, a certain wing of the university if they build on that will be named after me. And he's got his you know, whole thing ahead of him. And you come along and you say, uh, Pastor, I have some questions for you. Could you please answer these? And you start to go through and say, what about this? What about that? Why did they do this? Why did they do that? Well, well, you just, you know, those are very good questions. And I think that what you should do is actually stay in the system and keep your mouth shut and go off to seminary someplace so that you can come out and be like me. Understand that this is about money, okay? Uh, and what you really get shocked to find out, by the way, most of the pastors, they don't believe in this book. They'll say it has, has errors in it. And yet they'll call it God's word from the pulpit. How can it be God's word and have errors? Huh. But that's what happens. And so the young person comes away and they're saying, my whole faith, everything has been wrecked. And instead of attacking the system and examining the scriptures and saying, wait a second, what is this thing that I was part of? Maybe the church buildings are false. Maybe the Sunday build or the Sunday best clothing and all that. Maybe that's false. Maybe the 10% tithe is false. Maybe the worship music is false. Maybe all these different things. Maybe that's all false. No, what they do is they'll attack Jesus Christ and the King James. Well, most of them don't even use the King James Bible anymore, but they'll, they'll attack 
their new version, which comes from the Vatican, they don't even know that, but you know, they'll attack their Bible and Jesus Christ. And then they, they go out through, and then as they discover more and more of the evil of this world, they'll say, it's God's fault. It's God's fault. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow that? If there is such a loving God, I, I reject him because he's allowing all these things. And they never even realized that they were never part of the church. Ever. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is not one that covers up truth. The church of Jesus Christ is one that accepts the truth and realizes how bad things are in this world and that they're only getting worse and then you call out to God and say God please be merciful to me a sinner see that's the reality of it but um, another thing I want to make a mention of here is if you actually study the Jesus of the Bible and the Antichrist that the Bible writes about that's coming in the future um, you'll see actually that most modern church people worship the Antichrist I've done whole studies on this proving this um, he's a man of peace. He doesn't judge anybody. He hangs out with sinners and all this other stuff. And yet they never actually read the scriptures. And one of my favorite things to do, just I'll act stupid when I talk to one of these modern Christians. They say, well, my Jesus would do this. My Jesus did this. My Jesus did that. And I say, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. Where does the Bible say that? Um, uh, uh. They can't turn you in the Bible and say where Jesus did all these different things. But actually, when you study it, especially the thing of Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners, don't you know the Bible says that? Uh, yeah, actually it does. But it was the Pharisees that said it about Jesus. And Jesus is asking his disciples, saying, of whom, you know, or what are they saying about the Son of Man? To paraphrase. Well, they say that you're a friend of publicans and sinners. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not it. I came to call the sick, sinners to repentance. That's what Jesus Christ was doing. He wasn't there to hang out with them and be okay with their sins. He was there telling them, you're a sinner. You need to stop what you're doing. You're wrecking yourself. You're going to end up in hell for all of eternity. He was preaching to them. And the wicked people are saying, the wicked religious leaders are saying, look, he's hanging out with those evil people over there. He's a friend of theirs. See, it's an insult. To say that Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners. It's an insult. Jesus didn't say that about himself. Now, he's a friend of sinners in the sense of, okay, yeah, he died on the cross to pay for sins. That's true. But to say he just kind of hangs out and whatever and he's okay and looks the other way. Oh, no, that's not Jesus. That's the Antichrist. The Antichrist that the church building people worship. The Antichrist that uh, is going to cause people to have a mark upon their forehead. Mark in the right hand or in the forehead, but then Revelation chapter 20 goes on to say it's going to be upon the forehead. Like a tattoo? Oh yeah, the modern churches that don't warn people about tattoos anymore. And a lot of the uh, pastors and religious leaders out there are getting tattooed. It's going to be a big study coming up on it showing you some very shocking things about tattooing. Some things that you really need to take heed to if you're into the whole tattoo thing. We're going to be talking about that in the future. Let me show you something here. Revelation chapter 13, in case you don't believe me. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Um, where do you worship at? Church buildings. You're never going to find people that say, Oh, no, we worship at home. That Don't even think about church buildings. No, the vast majority of people would say, we worship in a church building. Walk up to somebody on the street if you don't you know, believe what I'm saying. Just walk up and randomly say, excuse me, do you worship anywhere? Do you worship, do you have some place where you go to worship or whatever? The vast majority, they'll say, oh yeah, I go to church. Or no, I'm not really into the whole thing. I'm not going to find somebody unless you walk into someone like me, which were very rare. True Bible-believing Christians are an extreme minority. Um, but you come up to me and say, where do you worship? I say, I'm worshiping right now. Seven days a week. <laughs> I'm in the church all the time. The church is a living group of believers. It's not a building, some dead building someplace. And again, I've spoken for years and years. I've preached against church buildings because they are not New Testament. One of the great preachers of the 20th century, Dr. Peter Ruckman, all of these commentaries up here, a lot of these books down here, and he taught in his one book here, I think it's the local church, this one right here, 
He said, as soon as you get a church building, you are anti New Testament. So then why did he have a new test or why did he have a church building? Because he didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't want people to think he was weird. His own words, not mine. I'm not insulting the man. That's what he said in his book. You have to get the people into the pews. Then you can have bigger bragging rights and oh, look how many people we have in Sunday school and look how many people we had in attendance and look how many souls, souls we've saved. Yeah. And what you do is you set up this two different life thing, two different ways that you can live. The one way that you live when you're in church and the other way that you live when you're outside of church. And if, you, if you've been in church buildings, you know that that's true. There are scores of people in those church buildings and they live two different lives. That's not New Testament. That is an antichrist system. If you've left that whole system, good for you. But don't you dare take it out on God and the Bible. This book is not a bad book. This book tells the reality of this world. Um, you can go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 if you have a King James Bible. And if you don't have a King James Bible, you need to get a King James Bible because this is the true book. The other ones are false. All these new versions and everything else. Again, do you even know where the new versions come from? Well, they're just updatings of the King James Bible. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are not updatings of the King James Bible. They come from the Roman Catholic Church, part of the Ecumenical Council in 1962. Proved it in my documentary, The Real Bible Version Issue Exposed. It's been proven. It's a fact. They came out and they said that we need to make translations jointly with separated brethren to draw people back to the Roman Catholic Church. The new versions, which many of them down here, I have most of them that are in print, those new versions, um, they don't have the power of the King James Bible. And the uh, new version defenders, these wicked satanic servants of hell, like James White and a bunch of others, D.A. Carson and uh, John MacArthur and a lot of these uh, high-ranking Masonic Jesuit devils, a lot of these guys, what they do, they'll come out and they want you to lose your faith in the King James Bible. Because you see, this book has power. This book is the most spiritually powerful book that ever existed on earth. Ever. You say, what about the original autographs? They never existed in a book form. Ever. This book is the book where there's power. So what about all the horrible things? Let me explain something. Like I said earlier, the reason that this Bible has all those horrible things is because it's telling you about reality. So when you start to hear things about this present day and age, you start to see the atrocities and all the other horrible things that just have no explanation. Why would they do that? You can say, well, it's been going on all throughout history. Every man in his best state is altogether vanity. There is none righteous. No, not one. They're all going out of the way. Read all the verses that condemn man in here. And you look at the bad stories back here in the Old Testament. All the horrible things that were done by the children of Israel. And you say, you know what? It's still going on today. You say, well, I don't know. if it. Okay. I'll give you a couple little key words that you can look up. All right. How about the firebombing of Dresden during World War II? Done by America. You know, the good guys. Firebombing, firebombing a civilian city, burning women, children, burning them to death, not going in with a sword and killing, burning them, slow, torturous death. How about the firebombing of Tokyo during World War II? Another civilian target. What about that? How about Pink Town? Did you ever hear of Pink Town? You want to just talk about the horrible stories in the Old Testament where the men were, went in and killed everybody? How about Pink Town? Look that one up. Um, American soldiers, servicemen during Vietnam went into this place, this one little village over there in Vietnam, all civilians, women, old men, children, and they killed everyone. Only one boy survived because he pretended that he was dead. He'd been shot by an American soldier and he just laid there, acted like he was dead. And they walked on by, but they killed everybody in the entire town. America. Um, get into the real reality of 9-11. What happened there? And you go down through. I can just go through so many things. The scamdemic. I've done try, try to put a, excuse me, <laughs> done tried. I've put out a lot of stuff about that, most of which has been deleted by YouTube. It's over on my Rumble account. You can go over there and watch the documentaries and the things that I brought out showing that. 
Look at all this stuff. Depleted uranium used by our military. Nuclear waste, radioactive nuclear waste. When it's shot out of something, it heats up. The core of the munition heats up and it'll go right through steel. But it's radioactive nuclear waste. So it's killing the enemy and our own soldiers. Look at Gulf War illness. And you can go on and on and on and just see how evil things are. And you just think, oh, wow. And then you actually get to the point where you really can be saved. Because you realize they're evil out there, but you know what? I'm pretty rotten as well. And see, how many church buildings teach you that stuff? How many church buildings bring you to a state of repentance? How many church buildings preach against your personal sins and make you feel uncomfortable? Not very many. And if they do, it'll only be certain sins and then they'll just kind of leave others, you know, just kind of shh, you know, not talk about those, especially of the sins of the big tithers in the church. But yet you want to take it out on God. It's foolish. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's what you are when you leave the churches and you go out and you attack the Bible. Want to know the truth? I left the churches. I used to preach in them. And then I left. And I use YouTube as a way that I can get to people because I'm certainly not going to go meet in church buildings. They wouldn't even have me even if I wanted to go. Um, I didn't go and say, okay, well, I, you know, I see the hypocrisy there, but I'm going to go over here to the world and, and there's no hypocrisy out here in the lost world, boy. It's, it's real here. You know, you go to this university, there's no hypocrisy at secular universities or anything. Everybody just gets along and whatever. No, no. What you do is you leave the frying pan and you jump into the fire. I mean, at least you hear some truth about Jesus and whatever else. You might have a chance, some chance, there at these church buildings of hearing some truth. But you leave and you go out to the secular world? The secular world that routinely covers up all the evil that goes on? The secular world that is committing evil and horrible, terrible things? How foolish. But you know what the text says there? Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You're being led astray by the devil and his little minions, the devils. See, there is one devil, but then he has multiple devils underneath him. And you're being led astray by that. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Everything came from nothing accidentally 4.6 billion years ago. And it was a pool of goo and lightning zapped the goo and the goo became alive and came out and bacteria grew and made dinosaurs. And then it shrunk down and made man. And then you know, over billions of years of death... We finally got to where we are today. Hey, isn't that wonderful? Leave Christianity for this. Uh, there's no heaven. There's no hell. There is no good, right, bad, wrong. Well, kind of there is, I guess, sort of. I mean, Hitler was kind of wrong for what he did, but I don't really say we can judge him through evolution because he was just eliminating inferior species. But the And you get into all this philosophical garbage and your head gets messed up. The next thing you know, you're out there doing drugs or drinking alcohol to forget the misery and the woe. And you just have to say, I don't want to hear about this. And I don't want to hear about that. You know, oh, hey, guess what? Um, did you see what's going on with the corruption in the government right now? Spent, uh, what was it, one and a half trillion dollars or something like that? Or I forget what it was. Half, no, it was half a trillion dollars. That's what it was. $500 billion spent in uh, 18 days, I think. Oh, no, no, no. We're getting better. We're getting better. Everything's fine. Oh, 500,000 dead soldiers in Ukraine. They're losing the war. No, they're not. Everything's better. Everything's getting better. Don't worry about it. Oh, there's uh, millions of illegals, young men of military age. I saw one of your comments. It was such a good comment. Um, when men go to settle someplace, they take their wife and children. When they go to fight someplace, they leave their women and children behind. Thank you for that comment. Very good comment. 
um, gave it a heart and everything. It's a wonderful comment. Uh, yeah, there's some truth to, to that. Why are these guys coming here by themselves? Because they're coming to fight. Lots of bloodshed is about to happen. So if you want to disconnect from this King James Bible and say, I don't believe in this King James Bible, well, then you're going to have to come up with some kind of way to rationalize all this killing. How do you, I mean, what is the thing that you people out there, you atheists out there, how do you reconcile all the killing and all the corruption and all the evil in this world? There is no being called Satan. It's just all kind of, well, you know, I don't know, man. I get, well, but yeah, but man's supposed to be better than he was in the past. I, huh, yeah, that's kind of an issue. <laughs> Study the King James Bible, the greatest book that's ever showed up on this earth. Read it. It's not against science. It's against oppositions, oppositions of science falsely so called. And you say, well, uh, should I deconstruct my, deconstruct my Christianity? Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. You uh, want to deconstruct your Christianity while there's still time. Uh, get as far away from these church buildings as you possibly can. Uh, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, apart from organized religion. Um, I don't want any, any kind of church building where people come and worship me and, oh, Brother Brian, oh, Pastor Brian, oh, Most Holy Reverend Father, you know, whatever. Pfft. No. I want to put people in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit, to interpret the pages of Scripture to them. You don't have to agree with everything I say here. I really couldn't care less. Um, all I want you to do is just to think. And don't attack the book. Don't attack God. Uh, drop your little self-righteous thing there and whatever else. Do some searching and studying of all the evil that's not just in the past, but that's going on right now. Look at all the horrible things that are happening. I'm going to be talking about a horrible situation that's coming from a secular book, a book that's not written by a Christian. Um, in my next video... This book right here, The Great Taking, uh, and you better take heed. Um, this guy that wrote this book is uh, professes to be a kind of a Wall Street insider type of guy, a guy in, in big finance, and um, very, very eye-opening, to say the least. Some things I have been warning about, and real preachers have been warning about for a long time. The church building people, never. Okay, you say, what's that? The debt trap. I'll spell it out right here. Again, another thing that you will never hear preached against in most of the church buildings. I never did, and I was born and raised in them, and uh, I never heard any kind of sermons about being in debt. But it's all been done by design. The fiat currency and the whole debt-based system, the credit that's been put out there, and people are all just in debt. Nobody has any money anymore. And their gold and their silver was taken away. Gold taken away in 1933, silver in 1964 slash 65, copper in 1982. Why? What was the reason? What's the end goal? This book right here talks about it. And so does this book right here. But this one gives you the real solutions to it. So look for that in the next study. But uh, if you're an atheist, please um, be very open-minded about this stuff. And before you start railing on God and, oh, he's so cruel and he had this and that, look at the world around you. This world is a very evil place. Most of the things that you see out there, they're distractions to keep your eyes off of what's really going on. All the lights and the glamour of Hollywood and everything hide the lives of people that suffer. Hollywood actors, why do you think they get drunk? Why do you think they get high on drugs? Why do you think that they can't stay married for very long? Because they're miserable. Because they're all there to blind your eyes to what's really happening. Look into war crimes. Look into horrible things that have happened like that. And we could go on and on on that subject, believe me. Um, but what will happen is when you start to realize those things, you'll see and you'll realize that, and you'll start to understand, let me say it that way, that uh, there is a being called Satan. Satan. And this being is called in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 in the King James Bible, he's called the God of this world. And it goes on to say that he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. Um, that's why you speak lies and hypocrisy. 
you'll attack your creator when your creator loved you enough to die on the cross to pay for your sins so that you could go to be with him in heaven and be safe. I know I'm going to be going to heaven when I die because I have an authoritative standard that tells me so. It's more than you have if you're an atheist. What do you have? Atheism has nothing to offer me. Remember that. Okay, if you're truly saved, what can atheism offer you to make you leave the Bible? There isn't anything. And we don't have to hide from reality like the atheists do. So that is going to be it. Watch for the next study on the Great Taking. Thank you for watching.